you know, firstly, thank you to MBI for inviting me to do this. It's, um, you know, it's an it's wonderful to be part of this cohort of uh, board advisors. And really, um, I think you guys have been really smart to bring in a good diverse group of us. Uh, my goal for today is really to look at broadening um, the ideas of how we can do electrification. Um, and the title I've, I've picked and you guys all wanted to hear was, you know, how do we electrify when gas bans are banned? Um, because I think we're all coming across that as a barrier in many states. Um, here in California, I know um, the CEC has also said they will not be able to go to an all electric code um, as much as we have um, all pressured them to do so um, because they really have a lot more constraints to work with. So um, what I'm hoping to do today is really show other opportunities and um, it should be no surprise to everybody that I will <laughs> be sharing the Passive House framework. Um, as a big Passive House fan girl, um, that's really been my um, core focus for the last decade. Um, but I, what I'm really encouraging you guys to do is look at it not in terms of a brand or a standard, but to look at it as a paradigm and the paradigm that can be really um, inserted and replicated into many other frameworks and, and, and structures, um, including the code itself. Um, so if we can look at it in that in that context and that structure, I think then um, it will it will really start to make a lot more sense. So um, if I can now find out how there we go. So um, what I'll be covering today is really looking at the sort of big picture of where we can intervene in the system, just starting at the high level of what we've been doing and how where we intersect um, with code specific to electrification. I'll be going and looking at these alternate pathways and then I'm going to do this real deep nerdy spelunking dive into the back end of the passive house framework. Um, I'll guide you through that because it's it's going to go deep and, and um, deep down that rabbit hole but we'll come back up again um, for air at the end and we'll look at other places to intersect um, and where we can also look at at other ways to move our electrification and our decarbonization goals forward. And before I flick to the next side, I want you to remember this girl on the bicycle um, and her dad um, to always keep this key question in mind and we'll circle back to the answer at the end. But remember, why do we build buildings? So um, big overview. Uh, every project that gets built um, has to navigate quite a, um, a minefield of code overlays. And it's really um, helpful to look at our electrification work in this context. Um, before we even get to the energy code, um, every project team, um, owner, developer team has to navigate a zoning code a local design regulatory um, uh, framework. Then it gets through to development and, and construction. Then we start to hit the building codes and the energy codes. And once the building is even built and occupied, um, we now have these benchmarking overlays that also um, are starting to be used as a mechanism um, for decarbonization. So. Um, we'll come back to this, but I really wanted to start at that high level so that we, we really know where we're interceding in this um, into the system. Um, we need to start looking at this as it, looking at these things really in a complete holistic process. Um, but what we're going to dive into specifically here is the energy code. Um, and also the, the passive house energy framework. So, you know, I really want to just put this in, in this bigger context so that we all know where, where we're starting from. In terms of electrification um, and how this fits into the larger context of these codes, um, this is an AC uh, triple E uh, graphic of 
the evolution um, in terms of energy use intensity of buildings against the code regulatory um, structure. And um, looking at how over time, um, the code, the regular code does these incremental shifts to, to decrease the EUI um, slowly um, but surely. And we're at about this um, between 55 and 60 for the IECC. Um, and California's Energy Commission is, is probably just slightly below that, but uh, honestly, I don't really think too much um, different. Um, and just to put this, the passive house framework in this context, our notional sort of EUI for, for passive house buildings is at about 30. And really the point I'm trying to make here is um, just to look at the idea of um, we can do uh, and support these incremental um, code shift changes or we can do the high speed rail um, version and kind of go straight to the end and, and hopefully even a little bit beyond. And it's this little bit beyond um, that I'm going to really do a quite a much deeper dive into now. So um, if we think about electrification and what the real goal for electrification is, it really is to support a 100% renewable energy future. That's the end goal for all of us, right? Whether we're using our code framework or a passive house framework or um, whichever other, um, you know, by any other means necessary, right? Um, so if we look at that end goal and we then work backwards to see what sort of buildings do we need to build and how do we need to design our built environment to support that? Um, it gets to be a really interesting discussion. And this is the question that was, you know, it's a sort of a first principles discussion and, and um, a question that was really looked at um, starting in about 2012 um, at, by the Passive House Institute um, and then rolled out in 2015 in this complete overhaul of the the passive house framework and this was the big hairy question that they really looked at um, and it got to be it's, it's a really fascinating overview of like how do we structure our, our, our building systems and our energy models to meet that end goal um, and if we use that context of our end goal is a hundred percent renewable energy use whether it be on the grid or at the building itself. What do we need to do um, to make that happen? And if we look at renewable generation, we can see um, the core um, variable in renewables is that they aren't always regularly um, you know, accessed. Renewable energy has a much more variable uh, delivery um, time frame. So let's work with that timing. Um, and this is sort of the base of really a subtle difference between the net zero and the passive house um, perspective is because of the variability of renewable energy generation. Timing is everything and peak load reduction is the first baseline step of what we need to do to support a renewable grid. Because um, as you can see in these, uh, you know, we've got both the daily peak um, to account for, but we also have the seasonal peak to account for. Um, so that's just the, the fundamentals of where, where things needed to start. And then, this is where I'm going really deep into the weeds. Um, so some of you will be familiar with this um, if you work um, more at the grid um, uh, grid level. Um, for those of you who aren't, don't worry, I'm gonna just give a quick primer on this. 
Um, but really, we do need to go all the way back to um, how source energy is accounted for and how it's incentivized in our uh, code uh, frameworks and in the energy models that support the code um, analyses and outputs. So um, we're going to look at what is a utilization factor. Um, and that's really, um, for those of you not really into the weeds of this, um, a utilization factor is really just the story about how um, much energy is used from where the energy is produced to where it's eventually used and what the losses are and the effectiveness of the, um, the transmission is along that journey. So this is the quick um, drawing. It's an old um, fossil uh, grid uh, story of coal extracted at, um, you know, at the rock face, uh, transported in transport uh, at the general and then converted into power um, and then transmitted on transmission lines to where it's eventually get used, it gets used. And for the historic um, utilization factor for electricity, it took about three watts of energy to deliver one watt of energy to the end user. So that's a sort of historically a pretty inefficient utilization factor. And in the US, um, our, our grid, you know, historic grid purchase utilization factor for electricity was at about 3.34 um, on this fossil fuel grid. Um, but that actually wasn't everywhere. And for those of you familiar with um, the grid structure, our US grid is divided into, I think it's five, five sectors. Um, and each sector varies slightly. Um, Alaska was historically kind of the dirtiest at about 3.5 um, electric utilization factor. And on the Western states over here where we are, California, uh, Washington, and Oregon, where we were one of the cleaner grids at 2.8. So that number, the 3.31, wasn't everywhere. It varied slightly, but that was sort of the average. And as we know, this has changed rapidly. And as our grid has morphed and new renewable supply has come online, um, that historic utilization factor has really come down um, the last number I could find of, of the most recent, of the national one, is now at about 2.9 um, for the for the the electric utilization factor. But what I really want to show you here is how regional and local this factor actually is, um, and this um, graphic really shows why uh, each of those grids is quite different and how even in a 100% renewable scenario will still be quite different um, because of just geographic um, and climate uh, specific factors. So if we look up in the Northwest, we've got tons of great hydro, all those blue dots really are all the big dam, dams and hydro. Um, obviously, the southwest doesn't have a lot of water, so having hydro is just really not a, not a realistic possibility. Um, but southwest, we've got tons of solar. Um, we still have lots of gas. Um, the Midwest has this fantastic natural resource of wind. Um, and then the historic rust belt, the coal of the Midwest, that's phasing out pretty quickly. Um, and up in the north, um, Northeast, they have lots of solar. They actually also have lots of nuclear. Um, but we also know from um, you know more recent um, updates to this, lots of great wind and lots of great renewables coming online in the Northeast. So remember this just for this context of like how we actually can get to 100% renewable and it's local and it's regional and it's grid specific. 
so if we go back to this, um, these factors, these um, utilization factors, and um, look at um, where this real shift started to happen in, in how we, we account for um, what source energies get incentivized in our uh, models and our codes. We could see even on the old um, framework, on-site solar and wind still had a really good utilization factor, right? One, anything lower than three is much better, right? It's much more efficient from um, production to, um, to, to where it gets used. Um, but in the old framework and in many of our codes and models that get used to um, uh, support compliance with our energy codes, fossil fuels still receive more favorable utilization factors. So natural gas, diesel, oil, coal, propane have historically give, been given much better utilization factors, which means that building designers were incentivized and still are to a large extent, much more incentivized to use these dirty um, source energy um, appliances and equipment. So this is where overhauling that framework and what your primary energy factors are and what fuel gets given better source energy factors was completely revised and revamped with the end goal of our 100% renewable um, future grid um, scenario. Um, and this illustration is sort of a really good high level review of how this really got um, restructured. And you can see the inputs were all assumed to be all solar, wind, hydro um, as, the, as the primary inputs um, with the direct um, use at the building being prioritized, which if any of you are familiar with the passive house framework historically, on-site renewable was not given any credit um, prior to 2015. And that got completely thrown out the window because of what I've explained um, earlier here. They then looked at storage because as you could see, um, some climates, um, not all climates were are, are really going to, and not all buildings are actually going to be able to utilize um, renewable directly on the site. So um, accommodations and account, uh, um, evaluations were made that looked at, okay, well, there's going to be short-term storage and we know already this is happening. Um, big Tesla um, a storage facilities being installed in Australia, um, Hawaii, uh, now in California, um, and there's lots of great innovation happening in these short-term storage um, facilities and um, equipment that's that's really happening um, in this area. And then long-term seasonal storage. Um, this is another big sort of like a really interesting uh, area of, of innovation and development. Um, I know it's sort of a, a very hot debate, but you know, and we're not really going to go into this really, but really wanted to still put this on the map that long term seasonal storage using renewable sources is being developed. You know, some of it's going to not really pencil, you know, it's right now hydrogen or methane, whatever, however you're going to convert renewable energy into a storable, a long-term storable um, uh, capacity solution is, is something that um, I think is a fascinating discussion. I'm not really going to go into it here, but I wanted to just also put it onto this big picture map of what got considered. Um, because it's really relevant for, for this renewable energy future. And um, 
this is sort of what we what the 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 passive house framework really um, reviewed and included in this complete analysis of the primary energy factors because the storage is part of the conversation that we will have to have um, for electrification. So um, I don't really want to go into the nitty gritty of this, but I really wanted to just again frame it in the context. Um, the passive house standard got totally overhauled in 2015. Um, the peak heating and cooling uh, requirements and the air tightness, none of that specifically changed. But the big bucket of primary energy, um, which in in normal you know circles gets gets really sort of talked as as, as energy use intensity, the total overall building the amount of energy that can be used um, to meet the certification criteria that was really completely um, revamped and revised and the focus for that was looking at this renewable energy end goal um, but it also really connected very directly to a carbon emission a carbon emissions focus and, and that's sort of the interesting part where I think that paradigm uh, shift and the restructuring, um, I think, is is something that can be um, readily used and and looked at by by every other framework and code uh, code revamping. Um, three tiers. We don't need to go again into the nitty gritty of this, other than to say um, the the structure. Uh, used to there used to only be one certification level. There are now three, and it was a it's a sort of a sliding scale scale function of the basic classic um, is your basic passive house building um, does not require um, uh, renewable energy on the building because we the, they recognised that it wasn't possible for every building. So there's still this um, allocation. It's still an incredibly um, a super efficient building. Um, it does require electrification. Uh, we'll get a little bit further into that um, in a little in a little while. Um, the sliding scale is really interesting, though, because it's a function. It's a ratio of um, you can you can get up to the next level of certification by either reducing your demand. So this this building, this X. As a project, this is sort of where it currently sits. And if these designers wanted to get up into the plus or premium certification, they could just drop the demand to bring it down to this 10 or nine um, PER, uh, the KBTU square foot number, would just get them into the plus, or they could increase the on site generation, which would shift it up into the next year. So, um, a little more flexibility for how uh, folks could, you know, choose to level up, so to speak. And then, um, rather, you know, we've, we've kind of done the big picture overview, but I wanted to sort of get into the real back end of how these factors were um, structured and evaluated, because I think this again goes back to this bigger structure framework that can be replicated and inserted into any other um, certification or even um, code um, revamping. And the basic premise of these primary fact, uh, energy factors was still um, starting with total demand reduction. Um, as I say, those the passive house, you know, uh, criteria still has a very rigorous, it's always um, envelope focused and really using your envelope as your first um, call, um, first opportunity to just drastically reduce loads has still remained in place. Then what um, the Institute did was they, they looked at the remaining energy that is um, used by buildings. And they divide that up into five categories. And these five categories um, 
Electricity is sort of the big bucket of like plug loads, lighting, appliances, um, all stuff that every building has um, and gets used, you know, generally this is sort of be considered like your base load, like the stuff that, you know, the usage that is pretty consistent throughout the year um, by the occupants. Then there's the hot water load, um, which could be easily used, um, monitored and, and extricated um, and, and categorized differently. And then these bottom three, heating, cooling, and dehumidification. These are what um, really needed to be accounted for very um, distinctly because of them being very variable based on local climate and your local grid capacity um, for renewable generation. And so, and obviously, you know, some places um, have peak, like a higher cooling demand than heating and other places don't need any dehumidification. De so they could, could subtly um, adjust these um, to really be um, quite climate and regional specific. The next thing they factored in um, was this roof area availability. And this is again, something that I think should really be looked at by code frameworks because dense urban buildings currently get penalized for renewable generation because your ratio of your roof area to your floor area um, drastically changes as your buildings get sort of taller. Um, so zeroing, net zeroing out a, a skyscraper is just really a physical impossibility. Um, so creating a mechanism that allowed dense urban buildings to still be um, equally credited on the same scale was, was something that I think was quite a genius move and could easily be um, incorporated into every other um, framework. And then, um, as I showed earlier, this, um, this uh, regional grid um, supply capacity was factored in. Um, we looked at that earlier. And, and so you understand that not every region has um, hydro, not every region has great solar, um, and but or wind. So um, all of those were factored in to see, you know, what made the most sense for, for each region. Um, the peak load, the regional peak load was also factored in. So obviously, um, southwest, southeast, much higher cooling peaks than, than heating peak um, opposite up in the north in Alaska. That was uh, considered this uh, capacity and the requirement, oops, where did I go, sorry. This capacity um, for storage was also considered because um, clearly Alaska is gonna need a lot more um, long-term seasonal storage um, capacity than um, the Southwest um, region. And then finally, Sorry, I'm having trouble seeing. I've got a small screen and I've got all of your mug shots on my screen as well. Um, so I hope you're, you're not, uh, yeah, my screen isn't being blocked by that too. Um, and so bear with me here, we're almost out of the weeds here and we're gonna get back up for air. So hang in there a second if you're, you're kind of, this is, this is blurring for you. Um, but really that I'm, I'm getting to is that storage was also a very uh, core part of this. And then finally, um, what we've been really honing in on this electrification, um, what type of appliances can really um, accelerate uh, decarbonization, electrification for a renewable grid? And um, this whole heat pumps um, are you'll see heavily um, incentivized in this framework and in the back end down in the in the weeds of the passive house um, energy model. So um, coming back up a little bit here, um, this is a just a quick overview to show um, the extent of how this was really analyzed. Um, 
So all of those factors were looked at for a global, you know, a global application of this framework. Um, and uh, you know, we can the the links to the back end. Uh, they published a lot of this information on um, their website, um, and I'm not going to go into this really. But it was it was quite a a, a feat to sort of really um, do this analysis for. Um, huge um, variation of climates across the globe. But where the rubber hits the road is, how does this work here? And um, honestly, I really only started to appreciate this myself once I started to put it into a context that I am much more familiar with. And this is these are the primary energy renewable, the PER factors for California. Um, I've extracted these out of the back end of the energy model and then started to put them next to each other because then it really starts to tell a fascinating story about how this works, um, as the kids say, IRL, in real life. Um, so if we look at these PER factors, and I'm going to start with I've got San Francisco, I've got um, Sacramento, and I've got San Diego. I've got all the other ones in here too, but let's just for the sake of like not having our eyeballs crossed too badly. Um, let's look at these big ones because I think most people sort of have a sense of, okay, Sacram San Francisco is sort of northernish California, Sacramento's inland, a lot hotter. San Diego is all the way down the south on the on the Mexican border. So you you get a sense of how those climates vary slightly. Um, and then let's look at um, what factors were assigned to heating, cooling and dehumidification, domestic hot water, and basic electric. You know, the, the other bucket of basically usually it gets called base load plug loads. And when we start to compare, you start to see those subtle nuances between somewhere like Sacramento, which the electric um, source energy factor, if you remember, the big historic grid one was 3.3, and it's now come down to about 2.8, and I think California were probably at about 2.6. The passive house framework says, nope, we think that on a renewable grid, this is where we will be. Our electric um, loads for a renewable grid will be at about 1.7 for Sac San Francisco and about 1.8 for Sacramento and 1.3 for San Diego for heating electric use. For cooling, um, 1, 1 and 1.25. So it's actually slightly pen of penalizing San, San Diego compared to Sacramento and San Francisco. And that's because they want San Diego to make sure that they're not doing stupid things like driving up cooling loads because you've got lots of passive opportunity in San Diego to use shading to drive your cooling um, loads down. Domestic hot water, heat pumps, so this specifically um, is allocated to heat pump um, hot water at 1.25. So that's a really favorable um, source energy factor for electric heat pumps. And then the other, the rest of the plug loads are 1.2, 1.25 and 1.2. Um, and if we look at what did they do for natural gas? So domestic hot water, they said, okay, it used to be one for gas. We're bumping that up to 1.75, which effectively penalizes any natural gas hot water heaters and favors electric heat pumps because 1.25 is lower, but not a lot lower, but it's still much better than 1.75. So the mechanism at play here is in terms of electrification, it doesn't say you cannot use gas. It says we are gonna make 
incentivizing electric heat pump equipment much better for you and we're going to slightly penalize gas appliances which is a very different thing than our gas ban approach um, and i want to just quickly i don't really need to go too deep into the weeds but again i you know what's what's instructive here is um, this is the same per factors but this is for the east coast and i've extracted the big cities there i've got pittsburgh i've got new york and i've got rochester so we know rochester is right up here north um, uh, north of new york state um, pennsylvania all the way over the west and new york city in the middle here um, really looking at the subtlety of this um, utilization factor structure where again um, these vary per city so it's very regional and localized um, based on how I, I explained the, the structure of it and again um, the natural gas um, fossil gas um, is given a much more a higher utilization factor to just subtly penalize it and say okay we're not going to say you can't use it but we're just going to make it much harder for you to comply with the standard if you specify that equipment and so Ronald, um, can you go back one to california if i may interrupt uh sure i was looking at smud and mm -hmm. is this a, is smud is a tiny bit higher the 1.8 on electricity for heating versus the 1.75 for gas is that a factor of a solar heavy grid just not having that much production on those cold winter mornings is that what's going on there yes and it's sort of smud you know colder inland sacramento gets a lot colder in the winter so they're really also trying to it's a sort of another mechanism to make sure that designers really reduce demand and you can do that with your envelope measures so you drive down your demand by by changing the factors as well um, you know you can comply with with you know that's sort of the baked in flexibility but does that does that answer your question yeah so the the grid factors are are driving it but it's also they're both relatively high sort of on account of the climate exactly yeah, and just you know, context again. Remember the 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 national grid, uh, the historic uh, utilization factor was at three point three. It's about down to two point six. So this is still very more, much more favorable um, than is is utilized in a lot of a lot of standard energy code compliance models. So um, again, real world application because this is space that I think you know where we as passive house ad advocates really live is at implementation and um, how do we really get buildings built to support a totally renewable um, grid and really drive decarbonization and I wanted to use this example um, it's a building that's been completed in New Jersey I think it was finished at a couple of years ago, I think like 2019, late 2019. This was using the old passive house framework. Um, it was designed and sort of uh, modeled and uh, didn't get completed, um, you know, prior to 2015. But the, the old grid, the old framework was still in operation and actually is still allowed to be used, which I'm, I'm pushing very hard to have that removed but the you know the new one has been been out since 2015 and, and is is widely much more widely used now um, the point i'm making here though under the old framework this had gas appliances it had a gas uh, domestic hot water units and it still complied under the old framework um, but when i put this into the new framework um, here with the per sliding scale it no longer met the basic um, classic certification um, requirement. You can see here the big no. Um, and that was because, and I, I literally didn't change anything in this building design um, 
and and that was exactly because of the ch the, the switch in these utilization factors where gas appliances now are way more uh, heavily favored and uh, I mean gas ones were penalized um, which put this building out of compliance it would only be um, a low energy building the same um, for this is an ADU I designed in Palo Alto here um, and under the old framework um, it was all it's an all electric one um, under the old framework this would not comply so all electric appliances because of the more penalized um, utilization factor for electricity doesn't comply under the old framework but um, luckily i was using the new framework um, and it does quite easily comply um, with the new and in fact we looking it's not it's not built yet the, the clients put this on hold and um, we can easily add um, a small bit more uh, solar and get this into plus energy and um, so just two quick examples um i'm coming up to 1248 i'm sure you guys also want to get to the the meaty part of like how do we bring this into to regular code um so we're just quick sort of summary of like this uh, primary energy renewable framework um, essentially it's demand reduction um, and prioritizes this renewable source energy um, it also gives credit it gives credit now to on-site generation it does allow off-site generation but actually only in the premium category so um, that's a subtle um, um, nuance to it um, and really the the takeaway that we we need to look at is is really it's the whole framework is completely designed to be um, ready um, and uh, supporting this 100 percent renewable energy um, grid, which is, as I said, the end goal of where we are all going for decarbonization. There's this another up a little nuance factors in there that aren't really that important. We could get further into weeds. So um, coming back up to that big picture of how do we now um, look at intervening into our regular um code and um, um all these other overlays that that govern building development and maybe start to look at other places we can intervene in the system because our energy code isn't the only game in town and i'm you know the looking really i've i've, I've highlighted here a bunch of other places where various policies are incentivizing this high speed rail compliance pathway that the passive house framework utilizes to drive decarbonization and really incentivize electrification and um, within these code frameworks um, i just wanted to identify a few um, zoning code is being used as a carrot um, up in vancouver uh, up zoning um, increased floor area ratios increased height incentives any developer who um, builds to passive house in vancouver can submit their project as long as they also develop and, and commit to passive house certification they can get those zoning incentives which is a very big carrot and it effectively also um, as i've shown is a is an electrification um, mechanism to drive um, building decarbonization the other carrot that can be used is accelerated approvals ministerial review lots of projects get bogged down in very heavy uh, design regulatory um, roadblocks any any developer who wants to um you know short circuit that um horrible um derailer 
cities can say build to passive house or build to um, Z, zero energy, um, they can put in incentives to say, if it's all electric, you can bypass, um, you can do a ministerial approval. So um, different places to intervene in the system. Um, BC Energy Step Code is a mechanism being used to um, have alternate pathways embedded in it that go around the, the regular code structure. A passive house is one of them. Um, but the top step, if if building developers say we design to that, it's sort of a, a way to, to fast track electrification. Uh, Washington State has an alternate compliance path for passive houses um, already embedded in the code. And then this fascinating um, option, New York City, I'm sure you guys are familiar with local law 97, that setting uh, benchmark requirements for existing large buildings at a greenhouse gas emission target. This is another fantastic accelerator that is outside of the energy code that is really um, focused on accelerating um, decarbonization um, with this greenhouse gas emissions metric. And then there's another whole pathway outside the code um, these are mechanisms that our passive house community is getting really good at using. Um, subsidized training, uh, workforce training and development. It is not an electrification mechanism that's on many people's radars, but every passive house consultant gets why electrification is really important. And the more people we train, to do that and understand that, the more buildings will be built um, in a manner that actually really supports a renewable um, outcome scenario. Um, low income housing tax credits is another fabulous mechanism that's really driven um, the entire um, Pennsylvania affordable housing um, landscape. Um, all really great projects, um, all maybe not all of them, but really since 2015, a huge a portion of those all electric. Um, financing mechanisms, um, indirect, uh, di both direct and indirect subsidies. NYSERDA is really using these um, quite brilliantly. Um, and so is Massachusetts. Um, Connecticut is also coming online. Um, we're also seeing um, a lot of the utilities now in California. We're working with PG&E. Uh, SoCal Edison, um, CPUC, um, and some of the RENs here um, to also really utilize these mechanisms to drive decarbonization and electrification. So I'm uh, coming up to the end here. Um, summary, really, we know that our energy code is um, the slow train, it's the all stops train. Um, it is required to be that way. Um, it is just how, um, you know, it is the baseline for all buildings. Um, the high speed rail opportunities like Passive House should be much more closely um, looked at and incentivized. It's, a, it's an opportunity that I think um, we have not done enough work in making sure that the top end, the, the, the overachiever folks get all the assistance and support that they need, because that is where we need to go. And the faster we get there, um, the better for everybody. So um, that's the end of my presentation. Um, there's tons of source material that I could recommend. Happy to share these slides um, with everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, I think the, the closer really is to, to go back to um, that young woman and her dad on the bicycle. Um, why do we build buildings, dad? Um, and we build them for people. Uh, I really want to close with that because I think sometimes as um, decarbonization advocates, we, we get a little distracted by all these lovely buzzwords like we're building for grid optimized buildings and we're building for a decarbonized future. 
and really just go back to remembering we build for people. Um, so let's make sure that those buildings really work well um, for all the other things that are just essential. Um, I think COVID has really put that in a, in a, a really stark reality for all of us. Um, health, comfort. Um, so uh, that's my, uh, my presentation. Um, and I would just be uh, very happy to hear from you um, and take take questions if anybody has them. Ramlin, thank you so much. Um, we have just a couple of minutes and uh, uh, Thank you, Bronwyn, for opening the floor for any questions. Um, and I just want to uh, reiterate that um, with the last couple of minutes, would anybody like to ask a quick question? Well, okay, Bronwyn, this, is, this has been in Portland. Here, I'll come off camera, turn my camera here too. At least try to. Uh, I have a question. I, I like how you ended, Bronwyn, in, in the whole presentation too. But uh, building for people, I'm thinking I, one thing I didn't quite catch is is the utilization factor in California is is the penalty on natural gas is that like a assigned penalty so that that already exists or is that coming down the pipeline? And how to, thinking about people, like what about the cost of of energy too, and who can afford to um, get heat pumps or you know, to how how is California looking at addressing the if they assign this penalty to natural gas, um, how does that pass on cost? Um, one last thing around people too is cooking in fireplaces. That seems like it keeps coming up with not natural gas bans, but nearly natural gas bans. So your thoughts on all that would be great. Thanks, Lynn. Um, so the the penalty for natural gas has been in place in this uh, passive house framework since 2015. So that's just, you know, it's pretty, that got rolled out in 2015. Anybody certifying uh, using this PER framework for buildings, and I've been doing most of my projects that way. You know, I've actually did all electric buildings since 2013. Here in California, we could still easily meet the criteria. Um, so that's that's been in place. I think that's just sort of the passive house certification um, and, you know, what other frameworks do with that is sort of to be determined. Uh, you know, I think that's really what I'm trying to share here is that paradigm, like how do we structure, how do we structure our, our code frameworks, you know, and the energy models that we have to use to meet compliance to maybe reflect that. And I think California has got a, a more nuanced evaluation with the you know, it's always used TDV, which does have some accounting for that. Um, the back end weeds of that are really black box kind of, and I, I don't profess to be an expert in that, um, but it does align a little bit better with this same framework. I, I don't know the specific factors. Um, and then your next question was cost. Cost is always, um, left to the designer. It has not been baked into the international passive house framework because you cannot really, um, it, you know, we, we don't, um, the passive house standard cannot account for price differences for appliances on a global scale. I mean, it's just sort of physically impossible. But that's where um, design teams get to make a lot more, they get to own that decision a lot more locally because we, we know like what things cost in our region. And just to sort of give you, that's it varies so dramatically. Um, you know, some of my early projects, I, I couldn't use certain product, products that were available on the East Coast, but nobody was distributing them on the West Coast. I couldn't, literally couldn't buy them in California. That's now changed. And so the other part of that cost um, question is really, 
that changes quite drastically over time. And we've seen just in my own projects, the cost of heat pumps has come down quite drastically since 2013. And that's a market driven, um, that's a market driven um, change. Um, we know just from everything, from cell phones, the early cell phones cost a bazillion dollars. As the market demand increases, the the cost of that stuff comes down. So it's it's really a market change, a market transformation mechanism. Um, and the cost, you know, that's what codes have to do is um, <laughs> do cost effectiveness. Passive house doesn't. So um, it's get you you can use them in different in, um, in different ways. So Ralph, you were waving at me somewhere. Sorry, I'm looking at my my big screen. I've got all the images on the big screen, and you, my camera's on my little one here. So um, that's okay. Yeah. I think Ralph had to leave. Um, okay. We're at a time just a few minutes after. And again, um, thank you, Bronwyn, and thank you to everyone who could join us today. I'll be happy to pass along your slides, Bronwyn, to our group. Um, and um, have a great day. Feel free to reach out to me if anybody uh, has any uh, questions or needs any help with connections. Fabulous. And I put my email on the last slide here, um, Bronwyn at nephnetwork.org. So i um, love to connect with all of you. And uh, thank you again for hosting me. This has been great, great pleasure. Yes. Thank you, Bronwyn. And thank you for being an NBI. Thank you.